Welcome, everybody. It is uh, 11 o'clock, so let's get this uh, webinar underway. Um, as founder and managing director of Inspire and Evolve, I'm really excited uh, to be bringing you this economic update webinar today. Uh, we know that when we can and are able to do our conferences, our business festivals and other events in the real world, one of the most popular sessions that we run as part of those events is an economic update. And therefore, um, with all that is going on in the world, you know, Biden's election win, Brexit, COVID-19, general economic conditions, we thought it was really important, although we couldn't get together in the real world, to put together something virtually where we could share with you and get an expert on board uh, to share their opinions on the economy, where we're at, and some predictions uh, for the future. So I'm really excited for this webinar to be able to um, introduce you and I'll hand over shortly uh, to Christian Gattaca uh, from Julia's Bear. Julia's Bear is a private bank that we work with with some of our clients that have exited their business and realise their funds. They look after portfolio management, wealth planning and also lending. So it's really great Christian to have you here today, so welcome. Um, but before we get into the nuts and bolts of what's going on and in the economy and Christian's update, I just wanted uh, to provide you all uh, with a little bit of an update on our services that we offer at both Evolve and Inspire. And I know that many of you on this call, and there's a great number of you on this call, which proves how popular a topic it is, uh, are a client of Inspire or Evolve or both. Uh, but I thought it was just uh, an opportunity to share with you where we're at at both Evolve and Inspire. So with Evolve, we are a business that brings together like-minded business leaders to share an environment to support each other, be that in a peer group, be it through coaching, or be it through one-to-one -one, uh, training and development. Um, and that can be with you and your team to enable you to succeed and to enable you to take the next step. So our services are quite wide-ranging. As you can see on the screen there, as I say, from peer groups to one-to-one -to -one coaching, to training and development. But of course, if you haven't yet looked into it, we have our weekly uh, Evolve to Succeed podcast, interviewing business leaders and those in the business community uh, to provide you with inspiration, sitting alongside our exciting content and articles. So, uh, and also if you're local, when we can get back out and you're frustrated from working from home, I just want a quiet space uh, to go and work. We also have our, our unique co-working hub in Ashley Cross in Paul. With regard to Inspire, Inspire's been around for 16 years now, which scares me to say that when it started with me, a laptop, phone and desk. And me and my fellow directors, Andrew and Chris, are really passionate about providing our clients, ambitious business owners, with help and assistance on their journey. Be that the core traditional business tax and advisory services, I'll be it more the services that we're providing at the moment in line with setting out some plans for our clients to navigate the difficult journeys that a lot of us are on in business, to set some plans for the future, to help them raise funding, to undertake strategic reviews. And we've got clients that are either purchasing or selling businesses, so the corporate finance uh, team and function are really busy at the moment as well. So. With all those things in mind, uh, we would love to have a conversation with you, uh, both at Inspire and Evolve, if we can be of any assistance. So that's the um, piece about Inspire and Evolve. And I suppose, without further ado, Christian, everybody is on this call to hear from you. So I'm going to uh, hand over to you. Thank you, Warren, and uh, welcome. Uh, happy to be here. Um, it's a bit of a virtual experience, but uh, we got uh, all the more used to that lately. I uh, hope um, I can give you some hints on what we think is going on right now. Maybe as we most probably meet for the first time, let me uh, share one of our deepest beliefs about uh, economics, financial markets and the future. Um, we think economists are, are not fit to uh, predict the future. This is uh, one of the deepest, deepest uh, misunderstandings. We think uh, the best you can expect from an economist is that the person is telling you what's actually going on right now. And uh, it's highly, it, it's extremely difficult to predict what's going to happen. We can work with some scenarios as we will do going forward, but it's really limited uh, what we can see in terms of the future, uh, not only 
in economics, but overall, of course, politics and uh, what have you. And I just would like to um, leave you with this before we uh, actually start, uh, because in our view, markets are exactly designed to do this job at their best to um, at least give a direction on what's going on. And therefore, we should not underestimate where markets are priced. And uh, I, I definitely warn people to just uh, ignore the market signals and you know just be trying to be smarter than the market. The market is not always right, but it is a, a fantastic way of, of managing uh, expectations and adjusting and having everybody voting with their money. Okay, so let's uh, dive into the content. Um, this is another bad habit of economists that they provide too many slides. Uh, overall, I, I did the same, yet my ambition is to basically be through with a um, kind of um, front presentation uh, within 20, 30 minutes, just to leave some room uh, for questions and uh, discussions uh, to basically tackle what, what you're most interested in. Okay, so let me give it a try. Um, yeah, you see the, the motto of uh, 2021 in our view is contain and heal. Um, we think this is on, on various levels. Of course, it's uh, directly related to the health crisis, but it also in terms, is also in terms of the uh, economic fallout of this crisis um, to basically contain this and heal the economy as well. And of course, there's also a political aspect, especially against the backdrop of a new administration in the United States and possibly also in Europe here after uh, at least getting some deal on Brexit. So uh, I simply would like to kind of uh, show you what we think is most important because look, there's plenty um, and please don't feel much to read anything. It's a uh, small print, it's bad for the eyes. I just wanted to have it uh, there and um, just be being uh, kind of able to, to put the, the central topics we think are important here on the plate. Um, first of all, it's a macro picture, contain and heal. We think this will be successful. We'll see some stabilization in the economy, a continued stabilization. We'll see, um, some economies uh, reaching their pre-crisis levels uh, as of summer, uh, some of them being later, but the overall world economy gaining traction towards the second half of the year. Then uh, a major topic is, um, of course, the US-China competition. Uh, this is a, a major um, geopolitical hotspot, of course. You know, we've been uh, used to seeing the downside of this. And um, so far it's been rather uncomfortable, especially uh, for investors or for exporters to be uh, exposed to this. Uh, we think there are also bright sides to this um, as it basically is a, a war for tech supremacy. And we think a lot of good things will come out of that. And we basically draw a parallel to the uh, Sputnik moment in 1957, if you remember um, at the time, you know, this, um, major reaction of the US uh, to uh, the perceived supremacy, technical supremacy of uh, the Soviet Union actually brought in uh, some of the things where we still surf on in terms of technology innovation and trends, not uh, at least, at the, least uh, the internet. So uh, there's upside there too. We think China will become an asset class. Um, I mean, in 2021, it's starting, it's ramping up. Uh, we think this is a long-term trend, and this is also um, some of the more positive uh, developments related to this um, conflict about uh, who's calling the shots uh, on a global scale. Then a major topic is valuations. Uh, people are highly concerned, clients uh, are highly concerned about uh, everything being expensive. Yes, against uh, their... Um, History, everything is expensive at this stage, but there are major differences in terms of uh, relative valuations. And we think this is a year where we see a continued and solid recovery, meaning the economy is recovering and so will and so are uh, corporate profits. And usually, and this is uh, at least the learning of uh, the past uh, 70, 80 years, that we didn't have any valuation concerns as long as there was an improvement in earnings. Usually when earnings roll over, when the economy is uh, overheating, then you get valuation concerns, which are 
of course, then relevant for the market, we would, uh, for the foreseeable future, next six to 12 months, simply shrug it off as quite extraordinary times, and then possibly revisit uh, this topic uh, by 2022 or whenever we get back to the so-called uh, normal. And then uh, I'll uh, kind of touch upon a few of the low probability events, you know, what happens if people are always interested to kind of get the um, next black swan. I uh, actually, I can't uh, give you much of a hint there. Uh, simply I would like to uh, highlight that uh, both the great financial crisis and the COVID pandemics, according uh, to the person uh, who coined black swan, uh, Nicholas uh, Nassim Taleb, uh, were no black swans. Both of them, the great financial crisis and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic were no black swans because they were known risks. They were uh, of the known unknowns. And uh, therefore, you know, to really come up with a, with a real kind of uh, black swan is an impossible thing to do. What we highlight here is, you know, the vulnerability of modern society when it comes to the internet infrastructure. You know, what happens if we have a major breakdown, an outage, uh, of regional or even global uh, internet. Uh, second point, and maybe um, quite unexpected at this stage, but if inflation uh, raises its ugly head, uh, what, what happens then? And finally, uh, what happens if we see suddenly um, a consensus building in terms of uh, fighting climate change, something which has taken a backseat, especially under the latest uh, US administration. So kind of musing a bit with, uh, you know, the uh, things which might not be uh, very obvious at this stage. Okay, so that's the um, current setting. Maybe uh, if I may uh, move on, uh, I will uh, basically uh, jump to uh, this slide here, uh, just to kind of put things into perspective uh, when it comes to uh, how special this COVID pandemic is uh, compared to any other um, crisis we've had in post-war history. Just showing you here uh, how much of employment was uh, impacted as opposed uh, to the overall output. This is the, the left graph. And you know, I, I said uh, before starting, you know, talking about our deepest beliefs, uh, we can't, economists cannot forecast the economy uh, at all. But this one is even uh, more difficult because this one is in fact um, an unprecedented one. So we, we've never had that uh, in, uh, we're, we're, since we have data, reliable data, we didn't have that, that modern economies had to shut down um, their most stable sector, which is services. And you see it on the right-hand side, you know, um, the uh, financial activities were actually, um, they, they were uh, not that much uh, affected. Uh, to the contrary, you know, um, if you look at the latest, um, banks earnings releases, you know, they had a bumpy year with all the volatility and all the trading that was going on. But the real core of the crisis was actually leisure and hospitality for uh, obvious reasons. And you see here, this has a huge impact in terms of employment and uh, a little impact or a, a, a quite given the size of, of employment, rather a moderate impact in terms of GDP. So we're here talking about uh, like the 4% economy, which is shut down and possibly will come back online, uh, hopefully by summer into the second half of the year. And then maybe from what we have today, if you look at what's discounted in markets, most probably the market is now basically factoring in that uh, this sector will get, get back to some kind of normality uh, in 12 to 18 months. So quite a, a tedious uh, recovery process here. Now, uh, if you talk about the shape of the recovery and uh, look a bit beyond the, the global scale, um, we think it's uh, quite misleading just to look at the growth numbers, breakdowns, you know, uh, kind of uh, quite fancy numbers if you look at 2021. But of course, this is mainly due to the fact that the breakdown in 2020 was so uh, extreme. And uh, therefore, we think it's uh, maybe worthwhile to rather look at by when the different uh, economies of the, the region, the various regions get back to their pre-crisis levels. And uh, you see, for instance, on the right hand side, China uh, achieved that uh, by the third quarter uh, of last year. So they're already above um, the output levels they've had uh, pre-crisis. And I think that tells you a bit of the story. You know, the market is uh, now playing with uh, because the Chinese achieved this, you know, getting back above growing above the level of uh, pre-crisis 
uh, at 80 percent of uh, leisure activity. So if you look at you know airlines and and passenger uh, frequencies and um, hotel bookings and the likes, uh, China is uh, only uh, at 80 percent, and yet they were able to basically get on an aggregate level above that. If you take uh, the US uh, with some help, uh, and we think that's the most decisive thing going on from here, uh, with some help of, of fiscal uh, stimulus, they will get back uh, to pre-crisis level by uh, second half of uh, 2021. So in six months or so, it very much depends how much of success uh, there is to uh, the recent initiatives of the new administration. But we had to, we had to revise our numbers up for uh, the US because um, we did not expect that the Democrats would get a majority, although it's, uh, it's ultra uh, thin, but it's a majority in Congress and that makes all the difference for economic programs. So all in all, we think the US will get back in the second half of the year. The Eurozone is uh, quite, um, at least given their um, long-term structural growth possibilities, they're catching up uh, faster than expected and should be there uh, sometime in 12 months from now. Then we have some uh, doubts about the uh, UK business model, but I get back to that um, soon uh, because uh, there we think it will take uh, quite uh, some time until we reach these levels. So all in all, um, this year is about uh, containing and healing and the healing actually takes place to a large extent via uh, government spending. So what we call here fiscal policy. And you see here as a share of output. So how much of your national income you're going to spend on uh, helping uh, the economy back on to get back on track. And you see here, and to the surprise of many, um, the Europeans and continental Europe is uh, among the most extremes. Uh, we think this is one of the major shifts in, uh, in policies and uh, macro policies in terms of how, um, especially the Germans who were extremely uh, conservative in terms of fiscal spending for Europe overall during the Euro crisis, they made a complete U-turn uh, in this crisis, Europe introduced euro bonds and will not even count it this uh, on top of, of what's there. But you see here, the Germans have about 40% of their GDP ready to step in and uh, at least 10% of straight uh, fiscal spending. So major policy shift there. United Kingdom um, as well, you know, in terms of um, support, uh, there is sizable support but not to the same extent. And of course, um, the overall euro bonds related uh, possibilities are now uh, gone away uh, with the, the Brexit and get back to that in, in a second. The United States, um, I uh, updated this chart um, for clients reasons uh, 10 days ago. Uh, after the latest uh, program that the new administration uh, announced, we think uh, they will add another 10%. So they will um, overtake and be in terms of Plain, plain support will be uh, the world's leader in terms of um, supporting their economy. So major efforts here to basically stem against this fallout of the global crisis. And here, um, again, whenever I try to explain how we view uh, the world, we rely on the people who know what's going on on the ground. And this is uh, purchasing managers. Uh, so those... Uh, people who buy on behalf of corporations. They uh, get surveyed every, every month, long-standing data series. And uh, you know, cut a long story short, um, we see here manufacturing being back on track. Dark green means a heavy recovery, positive developments in the industrial manufacturing. So that's pretty, or quite a contrast to what we had uh, nine, 10 months ago when uh, manufacturing was suffering as well. This time around, you know, have this kind of uh, uh, services sector, which is still uh, under pressure due to the lockdowns, but the industry and the industrial cycle has picked up quite uh, massively and will uh, further do so in our view. I talked about um, the U-turns we've seen in uh, fiscal policy and macro policy, so how politicians look at the way they should run the economy or help the economy. And uh, the biggest U-turn we've seen uh, is Europe, of course, with the introduction of Euro bonds and with the um, deficit spending they're up to in the coming 
years, not months, but possibly years. And the second and maybe even more important policy U-turn is monetary policy in the United States. And I think that's, for some reason, that's still underestimated in our view, um, because what the Federal Reserve did as a crisis response back in last spring is unprecedented from any data we have in post-war history. And what you see here is the change, the yearly change of available US dollars in the system and this is absolutely breathtaking, uh, what they put in place there. This is basically free money for all. And this is a strong invitation to the new administration to spend money like hell. Because as Jay Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve put it, they wrote a check, money for free. And they invited strongly, continuously and repeatedly the politician to use this to help the economy. So for everybody, we often hear that, you know, that monetary policy is dysfunctional. Um, I, I, and this is only going into financial assets and therefore the whole recovery is unsustainable. I'd strongly warn against uh, this narrative because what happens right now is actually a stage two, which, which is ignited. So yes, central banks have acknowledged that they have limited impact in terms of uh, what they can do to the economy. But now with this shift in uh, with policymakers, there's more to come in terms of aggregate supply, which means governments are going to spend like crazy in the months, quarters, if not years ahead. And we think this has serious uh, impact on currencies. Um, I'll try to speed things a bit up, um, not, not to be too short on, on the Q&A. Um, but we think the, the dollar cycle is turning. You see here the long-term dollar cycle. This has been seven to 10 years um, uh, cycles in, in, of the reserve currency. And uh, here you see that the most recent cycle has been extremely strong and an extremely long one. And we think this has now rolled over with this major money printing that uh, was done by the Federal Reserve and continuously uh, they will do so. So we think these cheap dollars will find their way into the global system and kick off a major dollar weakness going forward. This means uh, there will be alternatives, a very technical chart that's for the connoisseurs. Um, I'd uh, simply refer to the fact that we think uh, alternative currencies will come up or dollar alternatives overall. Maybe that's also why Bitcoin is actually has gone through the roof uh, because uh, this is also a shadow currency, gold to a lesser extent. But we think the renminbi, it's a Chinese currency, will be one which will be taken as an alternative. And finally, yeah. Uh, when we talk about currencies, uh, we have to talk about uh, Brexit. I think um, we continuously will discuss this topic still, maybe under different labels, because the Brexit is a fact. So first of all, uh, on the political institutional level, but uh, now also in terms of uh, trade agreements. And it's a hard Brexit. So hard Brexit means there is um, consensus, there is a mutual agreement on the trade side of things, meaning how you trade goods going forward. There's no agreement how services are going to be treated. And therefore we think um, this is still too early to call for a pound relief. We always said, you know, there will be short-term relief. There was some short-term relief. If you put it into perspective uh, to the longer-term trends, actually it's a minor blip. And we think markets are highly concerned about the execution and also the rebalancing of the uh, UK economy, because the UK economy has been thriving on capital inflows uh, over decades, so running trade deficits and then benefiting uh, on, in the city uh, with inflows of global capital, either through private individuals or global corp corporates who took um, London or Manchester um, as their main hub uh, for Northern Europe. Uh, we think this has now to be rebalanced. And if you kind of look at the pound right now, uh, it's still an overvalued currency. So surprisingly, we thought, you know, investors would be a lot more conservative uh, how they treat uh, the pound. But still, if you just take a pure um, kind of traded goods and services indicator, you know, which is the, uh, the green line here in, in the uh, shaded area, basically it should um, trade around uh, 90 five or something, and it's still quite uh, reasonably or quite highly valued. So we think um, 
going forward probably will not get much of an impact uh, when it comes to the currency side, but there's no sign of a major relief in, in the British pound uh, going forward. And uh, this is also something which um, basically probably will keep us busy in uh, not only in 2021, but in the years beyond. Of course, the politician declared victory on both sides that they had an agreement. But if you look at the small print, and this is quite a lot of small print, if you take the, uh, what is it, 1300 pages of, of the uh, treaty, um, if the small print then uh, gets um, basically executed, we think there will be a lot, a lot of questions popping up and possibly also some conflicts there around that because um, you know there's also this expectation of continental Europe that um, the uh, Johnson administration is trying to establish a business model which they call uh, Singapore upon Thames, which means you know that the UK would like to attract capital flows by kind of undercutting um, the uh, overall standards in continental Europe, and I think that's uh, just uh, an accident waiting to happen to see conflicts around that. So more skirmishes. Um, possibly uh, only in 2022 or following on the political side, but uh, purely from a, from a pound perspective, um, we don't see uh, much of a move going forward. And um, the biggest shift we see is the Euro against the US dollar. We see Europe kind of, uh, maybe it was a wake up call to see Brexit happening and painful, a painful negotiation. So maybe this uh, basically gave the continental European politician a major reason to shift their policy preferences. And we see this now happening uh, in uh, the currency move. So we expect the euro to strengthen, especially against uh, the US dollar going forward. Um, pound against dollar, that's really two rather soft currencies against each other. It looks as if there's uh, even compared to the pound, the dollar will be um, somewhat uh, weaker. Uh, against uh, the euro, we expect uh, some uh, appreciation of the euro against or at least from a technical picture but more or less uh, flattish and uh, maybe um, let's jump over uh, the precious metal grades and get to the fixed income space because this is one of those areas where people feel most uncomfortable because they think you know that the risks in fixed income is no longer um, basically reflected especially in the corporate bond market and you see here the experience of japan on the right hand side um, you know, just uh, it's quite technical. Um, um, I'm sorry for that, but it shows you know how the corporate bond market is structured. So on the left in AAA, that's the best companies, you know, the Unilevers and, and Nestles and so forth. And on the right is the most aggressively financed um, companies. And in free markets, in Western markets, usually uh, the, the bad companies or, or the risky companies have to pay up. In Japan, where these policies we've been talking about, you know, in the U.S. and so forth, are basically um, you know, uh, the next step, and you know, it pretty much looks like Japan and you see how much they pushed down this uh, extra premium that uh, the so-called bad companies had to pay. And we expect this to happen at least in 2021 for Europe and the US and therefore we somewhere place for those investors who still, despite the extremely compressed yield level, who would like still to own some fixed income, we basically rely on um, the, or we recommend to be somewhere in the, not the very aggressive, but in, in the uh, quite aggressive space when it comes to credit. All right, we talked about China. I think I'll jump over it in the interest of time. I would like to share um, uh, here a valuation chart, uh, also somewhat technical, but we were talking about, you know, the fact that everything was very compressed and um, or valuations were extremely high. So rates are extremely low and uh, everything was actually expensive. Now, what we do here, we do a comparison here of uh, equities against bonds. So very simple model is actually dates back to uh, Alan Greenspan who um, ran US policy, US monetary policy, uh, most of the 1990s. And he suggested just to compare uh, the relative yields. So if you take uh, what you get in terms of earnings yields and stocks and you deduct um, what you get in the so-called risk-free uh, asset, which is US treasuries, you get a, a, a difference to see how much you get rewarded for owning risk. And you see quite two unusual phases, which is uh, 1929 or the year 2000. So in 1929, it was even more extreme. Uh, at the time, actually on that metric, uh, investors were paying up 
to own the riskier asset. So meaning, you know, they were so much in love with stocks that they would do anything to be part of uh, this boom. And this, re this led to absolutely ridiculous levels when it comes to valuation. And the same to lesser extent holds true for the year 2000, uh, which you can see there, you know, also with the red dot, um, that's when investors were completely shrugging off any risk, you know, and, and the um, belief at the time was that in the long run, stocks will outperform anyway. So we basically can discount that. And of course, there were major uh, wake, up, wake up calls to that. And if you take the latest reading, uh, we can't claim that uh, the overall average investor is exuberant at this stage. And that's why we're still uh, quite keen on uh, owning equity risk on a global scale. Um, Swiss equity is one of my favorites uh, for global investors, and this goes back to a, a gentleman, uh, a esteemed uh, client of ours, who, who approached me after a presentation and told me, why, why are you not talking more about these excellent family-owned businesses you own in Switzerland? And uh, he was uh, at boarding school in Switzerland 50 years ago, and he said in the past 40 years he owned you know, major stakes in um, family-owned businesses in Switzerland. And, um, you know, this is, of course, as a Swiss bank, you know, you think, you know, it's somewhat biased, but it's not per se that the Swiss uh, corporates are better just out of their DNA or so. It's simply the currency which uh, puts so much discipline on capital spending in Switzerland and preserves the wealth of, um, of the Swiss corporates. So if you ever think about diversifying uh, some of your UK equity holdings, uh, please, um, consider Switzerland because this has an extreme long-term track record. We like information technologies, we can talk about that. We think healthcare is under-owned and undervalued at this stage and uh, small caps are the opportunities in the opportunity in our view. You know, you see on the left hand uh, how much they got beaten down during the crisis. Uh, we, think, we think now with the economy gaining traction, uh, these risks should be going away. Of course, you know, if you own small caps or small businesses, usually they have much more difficulties to weather the storms because first of all, they don't have the global reach so that they can compensate you know, in, in various regions. And secondly, they're usually more aggressively financed. So that's why we probably see this uh, major discount. We think this will reverse and it has already started to do so. And uh, one of the major asset classes is China. Depends on how interested you are in that. And maybe uh, I conclude on the equity part uh, with uh, UK equities. And uh, this has been a, a dreadful um, 15 years or more in uh, UK equities, at least on a, on a relative basis and considering the currency, which uh, gets often overlooked. And here we simply show how much less uh, UK-based investors made uh, in US dollar terms as opposed to if they had invested their money into US stocks in dollars unhedged. And, you know, we were baffled by how, how low this could go. And um, we think uh, maybe there's um, darkest before dawn here. Um, so we are looking into whether we basically close this negative call on, on UK equities given what we have in terms of economic prospects, all the uncertainty around Brexit, we still struggle with that and we'd rather wait uh, for more signals here. All right, I think uh, given uh, time, I'll uh, maybe stop here and uh, quickly walk you through the final slides just, just that you know, you know, with what we could discuss. Uh, we have prepared something on crude oil, on gold, of course, uh, but also about, about the long-term trends, which we think are the most, um, uh, noteworthy in at this juncture this is something where we think uh, investors will look back um, in a few years and and think this is a major a major uh, opportunity and uh, in the following slides I also had, had some color to the single topics but maybe um into the benefit of of uh, interaction and the q a i shut up here and um, i thank you for your attention uh, 30 minutes is a, is a long time online and i uh, thank you for bearing with me and uh, back to you warren Thank you, Christian. A fascinating kind of insight. And we've already got some questions uh, forming here. So uh, if you are on the uh, webinar and you want to pose a, a specific uh, question to Christian, as he said, we, we wanted to leave plenty of time for questions to get you to be able to pose and get the answers to the things that are really important to you. 
and use Christian's expertise to the fore for our clients. So uh, the Q&A function is open. Uh, as I say, we've got some questions being posed. Please type them there. Most efficient way for me to pick up the questions and pose them uh, to Christian. But Christian, thank you for that insight. I found it really exciting and insightful to see. And part of that was around that, you know, the piece that interests me most, and I'm going to take the um, first question actually, is is those time skills for the world to sort of return to pre-crisis levels. And it's interesting to see that a lot of areas and economies in the world are going to return at a similar time. But the UK um, is so far behind that kind of curve and that uptick. Um, is that, do you think, purely because of Brexit? Or is there other factors being kind of coming into play there that will take the UK longer to come into pre-crisis levels? Um. We, we think a lot of it is, is uh, Brexit related and uh, due to the uncertainties. And uh, whenever you want to get back to your pre-crisis levels, you usually build on your strengths. And uh, this is exactly what is now kind of uh, keeping back uh, the UK economy because their strength was, you know, free available capital, uh, strong capital flows, money flowing into the city. And then they're getting recycled, taken up by the financial players. And uh, basically, uh, having a, a, a major exposure to a, a global recovery. And I think uh, given the uncertainties right now, especially in the services sector still, you know, if let's say you're a, a foreign bank, you're a US bank and you think about your uh, ventures uh, like JP Morgan, for instance, or Citigroup uh, out of London, uh, actually this latest agreement didn't really tell you a lot of what's going to happen in the next uh, one to two years. So I think that will, that will just keep um, corporates from um, putting in money as they would in a usual recovery back into into uh, the UK overall, but also the uh, city of London especially. And and then we think this is basically uh, the, the major reasons reason why this time around um, the UK will lag. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Right. So on to our participants and their questions. Um, one with regard to sort of. The housing market, um, obviously something that's close to all of our hearts in the UK. Um, so the question is from Jack uh, Bond, and it says, in relation to real estate, if things carry on as they are at the moment, between the summer of 2020, summer of 21, we may have experienced up to 10% national growth in property prices. Um, and this is sort of occurring in one of the, those worst recessions in history. Is your belief that real state can get away with it and without having a serious correction um or do you think it will correct itself soon uh rather sooner uh, rather later than sooner i was going to say i think uh what, what we have in terms of indications of of the major central banks and i think the bank of england is included there uh given the growth prospects there is no way for them to go back to um tighter monetary stance uh, anytime soon and uh, the fed was uh, was talking about this major u-turn the fed was uh, very outspoken uh, about not raising rates in the next two to three years and of course you know this is uh, basically giving a fantastic um, kind of uh, prospect to uh, owners of, of real estate because what usually kills your uh, real estate cycle what really puts real estate prices under pressure is uh, central bank or global central banks, which tighten monetary supply, and then the, you know the economy rolls, the economic cycle rolls over, and uh, ultimately also the real estate cycle rolls over. And I think at this juncture, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not that close, of course, to the uh, to the situation in in London or in the UK overall. Uh, but the only concern you usually have in in this environment, you know, low yields forever, is uh, oversupply. You know, if if there's too much activity at some stage, you know, they this will simply be drowned in too much supply. But the corrections there are are a lot more a lot more muted. A lot less dramatic than the ones we had uh, 12, uh, 15 years ago, where you had a uh, central bank rate induced correction. So, in a nutshell, we think um, this is uh, overheating and it's again unsustainable, of course, in the biggest scheme and longer term. Uh, but overall, we think uh, until the mid of this decade, most probably we will not see a, a sizable uh, breakdown unless. Uh, the economy um, really surprises to the upside on a consistent basis across the world. Perfect. Thank you, Christian. Uh, we've got two very similar questions from Alan Reid and uh, Tim Lewis. Um, 
and they're both asking for a view on the outlook for interest rates. You know, what's your view on long term interest rates in the UK and worldwide? We expect that they will be uh, rising moderately, not really kind of going through the roof. But uh, again, you know, this is a function of what central banks put in place. Um, we, we model uh, where the interest rate should be for the US, for instance, uh, given where commodity markets are trading. So we look at copper uh, versus gold. If you take that metrics, which are the metric which has been very reliable in the past 30, 40 years or so, actually the US treasury should be at around 2%. We're trading just uh, slightly above 1%. So you see central banks are artificially compressing this yield uh, recovery. And uh, if you see yields rising, it's basically uh, should be taken as a sign of success of these stimulation um, stimulus policies that are put in place. So it would be a comforting thing. What you would not like to see is spikes. If you see suddenly, you know, rates shooting up it would tell you that something is getting out of control. But uh, overall, we think we will we'll have moderate, very moderate increase in the next 12 months. Uh, on uh, on uh, sovereigns, uh, on, on yields of um, the established governments. So slightly, but due to a better economic outlook and no dramatic increase uh, on the horizon. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from Julian Spector. Christian, um, do you believe that Brexit will have a lasting negative effect on UK, UK EU trade? Uh, given the friction being introduced in relation to you know, purchases by consumers from Europe, you know, the VAC, red tape, VAT, tax implications, um, and you know, the, do you think that's going to be long term or do you think it's a short term effect? That's a, that's a tough one, you know, I think it's very hard to, to basically um, foresee uh, how, this, how this will evolve. Uh, my best guess is that um, this is still, well usually, let me, let me tackle it uh, from a different angle, usually if the, if the rules are clear, everybody gets surprised of how fast the economy is getting back on track. That would mean, you know, if there was all the rules were clear between the two partners, I think we would be very surprised to see that things normalize much faster than any economist would have uh, foreseen. Now with all the uncertainties and, you know, the devil lies in the detail and the 1300 pages, I think this probably will take a, a, a lot a lot longer to be uh, basically put in, in uh, into reality. And therefore I would expect that the disruptions Maybe not on, a, on an overall level, but you know we'll have just uh, more of these risk disruptions. And my best guess would be that it would take um, rather uh, two to three years at least than uh, twelve months, which, it, which would be the usual time frame. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, question here. I have an, I actually have a personal opinion on this, but uh, question from David uh, McDonald. Uh, the UK. Magic money tree has been very productive recently. This seems to be a difference in opinion amongst, you know, economists as to whether this will increase future tax burdens for UK businesses and individuals. Uh, what's what's your view, Christian? I think that uh, relates back to this uh, kind of buzzword of of uh, Singapore upon Thames. You know, how how would you like to attract uh, capital flows, if at all? You know, if that's going to be the future business model. Uh, would it be then uh, via cheap money? Most probably not. Um, cheap money meaning, you know, that it's extremely attractive uh, for, um, let's say, uh, uh, rich Asian individuals or, or uh, rich um, uh, continental European individuals to, to buy um, property and, and relocate to, to the UK. Probably that would be not enough. So I, I suspect, you know, if that was the plan, if that's taking uh, form, then uh, we would see... Um, if anything, uh, lower taxes or at least a, a more uh, generous uh, setup. And yeah, again, I think, um, you know, for those who, who are familiar with this uh, modern monetary theory, uh, which is uh, now propagating in the uh, United States, uh, it, it, it feels as if uh, politicians suddenly turned to a um, um, policy mix where they think they can uh, increase fiscal deficits forever without being punished. I think that's going to backfire, but most probably will not backfire in this decade, but in the next. You think that, so you think the, the effect of those huge budget deficits isn't gonna be short term. You think governments will be not sort of overburden with tax. You think that will come in the, in 10 years time or, or you know, the next generation really? 
Yeah, I think um, it's it's hard to exit those uh, policies. Uh, of course, everybody tells you that you know they do this uh, to fight the crisis, and then as soon as you're going back to normal, you just realize whenever you remove this uh, stimulus, then the um, economy tanks bit because uh, you know economic actors have become used to these injections, and if you remove them, actually the um, the uh, adapting can be quite harsh. So you have to ramp up again as a response, and then you get into those cycles and uh, end up with with a huge um, deficit yeah. and uh, you know if you take the reagan era in the united states of course you know he's uh, he's the hero of, of u.s politics but he started at 30 percent uh, debt to gdp or so debt burden versus their economic output at 30 percent he ended at 45 percent and at the time that was quite sizable yeah it's interesting isn't it and, and i take on board what you also say christian about singapore on, on terms you know tax rates aren't going to increase significantly in the UK if that is you know Boris Johnson's view and the government's view is to make the UK an attractive place then they're going to have to keep UK tax rates low. We do have um, you know, obviously our budget in the UK on the 3rd of March and perhaps we'll get a little bit of an indication of policy then but maybe it's too early because we are mid-pandemic uh, still at this time. So moving on to the next uh, question, um, what are the potential macroeconomic uh, fiscal effects of cryptocurrencies becoming a bona fide world currency used in trade? Will we see, you know, economies struggle to regulate that? Is that a challenge we're facing? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But you know, the the only thing which makes me bullish for cryptocurrencies is the fact that all the bankers hate it. Yeah. You know, the, the, the bankers, and including myself, I don't understand it. I don't understand the concept. I, I don't understand why, if you don't trust your central bank, why would you trust a, a very uh, decentralized, opaque system where you don't know who's calling the shots on, uh, you know, how the structure is going to be in the future? I don't see, you know, how much more trustworthy it is. This is one point, and I think from a regulator's point of view, um, if they're successful, and it looks as if uh, Bitcoin, for instance, uh, is quite successful at, at becoming uh, the uh, gold standard in, in cryptocurrencies, if they are successful, um, they will they will cut them and forbid them and basically banish them, uh, and possibly even in a in a in a global effort, the central banks will will have a go at them, and then, and that's even for those um, who follow this discussion, uh, even even more um, kind of concerning. Most probably, uh, central banks will adapt their um, monetary technology to these uh, cryptocurrency standards. And that means, you know, at some stage, and in China, we're already there. In Sweden, we're close to that. At some stage, you will not be able to hold any cash. And this will allow um, the, uh, the governments to basically have a full, um, a full access to any money which is in circulation in the economy. So I think... Yes, you know, this is, is a fantastic ride, possibly will continue for quite some time. But if it's getting uh, into the area of where it's a threat to uh, the established systems, meaning uh, the established currencies worldwide, we think uh, this will uh, backfire big time. And then, uh, you know, this will be um, yeah, uh, a standard which uh, is then taken over by central banks. OK. Um Another question with regards to the stock market, stocks and shares um, from Elaine. The stocks and shares have uh, bounced back recently. Um, do you see that continuing or is Brexit bites and government support is cut following COVID? Do you see another dip in the kind of UK equities market? Um, well, first of all, you, you can't, in my view, you can't predict the setbacks because I think you simply have to take for, for granted what's, or acknowledge, you know, that the market is where it is. And uh, again, you know, being smarter uh, can be a very, very, um, a very dangerous game. So therefore, uh, I'd rather can be concerned about uh, the relative uh, performance of, of UK-based assets, especially considering the currency. And I think... Um, Unless we get, this, you know, you remember the chart where you had like uh, 15 years of underperformance being at home. Um, unless we really get a, a major signal to the to the upside, you know, this uh, probably will remain um, the uh, the topic. And maybe you know, in pound terms, it will not look that bad uh, being invested in UK equities. Uh, but if you take Chinese stocks, and I think that's the, the next big market or it's actually the second biggest market but only two percent of global investors own chinese equities i think that's something 
uh, I'd seriously consider being a, a UK-based investor as um, kind of to, to balance the risks of, of having these, uh, current, um, this current situation at home. So I think, you know, or Swiss stocks, as I said, I think it's still, the, the mantra is still not to hope uh, for, for a reversal of a, of a 15 year old trend, but rather to look for some ways of, of basically joining um, the winners uh, in the long run. And then hopefully, you know, you we'll, we'll get some recovery uh, sometime when it's clear how the Brexit rules are, are implemented. Okay. Question here, more in specific, really relating to smaller businesses and are those perhaps in the startup sector? Um, what do you believe the kind of economic scenario is for sort of startups, uh, smaller businesses in, in the UK and the growth potential that they may have, Christian? I don't think anybody can give you a qualified uh, assessment of the, of the growth uh, prospect because it very much depends on, on, the, uh, on the business models themselves and they're, they're quite diverse. Um, I just, you know, as with the other financial assets, you know, we just saw a, a major wave of, uh, of uh, money hitting, hitting the space. And um, uh, probably, you know, there were also a, a lot of, of um, businesses getting financed, uh, which do not have a, a future. This is the usual, by the way, you know, there's always a, a rather large share, which doesn't make it uh, over five years or so. But I think, you know, at this stage, because so much capital has been chasing um, these business models, I think it will be just to the very few of them uh, who, who really will, will uh, make a difference. Therefore, on aggregate, I think you can't really make a qualified um, statement. I just think, you know, there will be these very few, the happy few, possibly, you know, the, the FTSE 100 in, in 10 years time will hold uh, five to 10 uh, companies which are in a startup uh, mode right now who will make a tremendous, will have tremendous success. But uh, and the art for the private equity and the startup and the uh, venture capital investors is to exactly pick uh, those uh, early on. And, and that's more of an art than a science. Okay. Thank you, Christian. And then we've got one final uh, question, uh, which is from Chris Palmer um, from AnyTech Solutions, who's in the IT sector. Um, and he's seeing um, bursts of high economic activity, I suppose, as you know, in this scenario, retail, travel, hospitality sectors are struggling, but there are sectors, you know, IT being one of them, telecoms, you know, there are sectors that are um, receiving higher economic activity perhaps expected. So I think that's the nuanced question. And, it, and the question is, uh, what is the source of this confidence? Uh, and is it a real assessment of the current economy? Do you think that we can plan based on that level of activity? Or could we see a drop off? But it nearly comes back to your V curves again, doesn't it, Christian? Yeah, exactly. But I think, you know, it goes beyond, uh, beyond the, the cyclical recovery. I, I I mean, you know, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is the, um, the uh, semiconductor equipment company, uh, the Dutch one, ASML. They reported numbers yesterday. And uh, probably the, uh, the person asking the question is aware of, of this company. This is the world's leader in, uh, in uh, the, the kind of the absolute state of the art uh, semiconductor equipment. And, you know, this is not, we're not talking here about small business, but they reported, I mean, believe it or not, they reported and this is relating to a pre-crisis number. So the first versus the first quarter of last year, which was not heavily affected by, um, by the COVID crisis, they reported a 30% increase of orders and sales. 30%. I mean, wow. you, you just see, you know, the world is short of high or, or sophisticated chips, you know, the computer power, there's still bottlenecks there um, in the whole value chain. And I just think it just tells, you know, how much, how much uh, need there is and how much we see in terms of, of uh, revolution when it comes to the whole IT sector, which is, uh, and if you take all these uh, fancy, you know, uh, new Silicon Valley uh, stocks, they basically get with this type of, of technology into very established uh, markets like uh, you know the taxi, the cab market, uh, you know Uber, or into the uh, the uh, you know the uh, leisure uh, markets, and they basically change this via pure computer power and sophisticated systems. And I think that's why we're going to see this continuously because it's possible from a technological point of view, it's possible to disrupt these businesses. 
and uh, therefore they will do it and there is a shortage on on the computer power to basically facilitate that so i think you know this boom uh, will continue and maybe now as a final remark you know maybe we'll get some interruption of that because you know the 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 uh, airlines are getting back uh, on track and uh, we see the uh, the hotels going back to normal but this is usually then a six to nine months uh, intermezzo an interlude and then you know the structural trends take over and therefore i'd i'd not uh, kind of um, stop being invested in in the it space it will be a tough run if the economy goes back on track but uh, come summer or maybe a second half of the year you know this structural boom will uh, continue Brilliant, Christian. Thank you um, for uh, that insight and the, in the presentation. And actually, uh, that time taken in the Q&A session, which was fascinating. It was great uh, to give our audience the opportunity to pose their questions and questions um, that were relevant to them. So Christian uh, Gatica, Head of Research at Junior's Bear, I really appreciate you taking an hour of your time to spend with us today to share your expertise and your thoughts. I'm sure the attendees of these webinars would have taken a lot away from that. So thank you, uh, Christian. Uh, and that leaves me just to do uh, a few thanks really. I'd like to thank uh, Ursula, Amy at Evolve and Rachel at Inspire. Behind the scenes, they've been putting this together. They've been organizing and doing the liaison uh, with Christian and his team and also uh, getting all the invites out and getting you as attendees here. So uh, Ursula, Amy, Rachel, thank you for that. I'd like to thank Matt and Rowan, our partners, at Junior's Bear, working along the South Coast and in Paul and Bournemouth uh, with their client base. Thank you for your introduction to Christian and your time and efforts in making it today happen. Um, really, um, a final thank you is to all of you that have taken the time to attend today. I mean, we put on these webinars uh, thinking that there'll be a relevance, usually because they are of interest to Andrew, Chris and I uh, as well. Uh, and on subjects that we think are relevant to our, you know, both Evolve and Inspire's client base, which is clearly ambitious, driven, uh, entrepreneurial, owner-managed businesses uh, and those that go with them. As we help you on our journeys, be that through traditional business tax advice, be it through putting you together in like-minded people in peer groups, be it providing insightful content and activity. So I suppose the last message from me, from both an Inspire and Evolve, perspective but also from Andrew and Chris and I from an inspired perspective we would love uh, the opportunity to have a conversation with you as I say many of you are clients uh, customers of Inspire or Evolve or both but we'd love that opportunity to have a Zoom call uh, to have a copy find out more about you more about your business and see what we can do to help you so if that's of interest please uh, do reach out to us and we will follow up of course uh, in due uh, course so Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, again, one final thanks to Christian Gatica, Head of Research at Julius Bear. Thank you for your time. Thank you.